This is Information Service Engineering Lecture Number 9, Knowledge Graphs, Part 4. Before we come to the subjects of the current lecture, let's recapitulate the last lecture. What did we do? We started with two excursions on the most popular openly available knowledge bases, which were DBpedia and Wikidata, because we were using them as a source for our queries that we further on then formulated with a Sparkle query language. So you learned about the Sparkle query language, what are graph patterns, what's its general query format, what is the Sparkle protocol, and we did more complicated queries then based on regular expressions with aggregations, and we also did federated queries. So last lecture was all about Sparkle. This lecture now will first focus on another modeling language. It will focus on the web ontology language OWL. Now you might wonder why web ontology language is abbreviated with OWL, o -W -L. it simply sounds better. There is an anecdote, so some se a semantic lore um, somehow connected to it. You might look it up in Wikipedia. So there are several explanations, but I can warn you all of them, they were created later on. However, what is OWL? OWL is a rather important modeling language. It's based on a description logic. So we'll, you will also learn what is description logic. And we will have a very, very brief recapitulation of uh, propositional logic, first order logic, to come up with the notion of what is a description logic and what, how does it relate to OWL. Most importantly, OWL2 is, let's say, or it possesses sufficient expressivity while maintaining uh, at least computability, so decidability. This is interesting from a complexity theoretic point of view. However, what you will learn there in OWL is of course to define more complex and more sophisticated things like in RDF and RDFS. So therefore also we have then here a second part of OWL language where we will learn how to define complex class definitions based, for example, on property restrictions. And another section in this lecture, you will learn how to co create complex properties, how to put constraints also on properties like transitivity, for example, reflexivity, symmetry and stuff like that. So this is then OWL, the major part of what lies before us. And then, of course, another very important part of the lecture will be we will apply all the stuff we have here in the knowledge graphs by applying it in knowledge graph programming. So we will use here the programming language Python simply for sake of simplicity and show you how to read knowledge graphs, how to visualize knowledge graph, how to manipulate knowledge graph and how to use Sparkle and how to Sparkle external Sparkle endpoints somewhere on the web and then make use of the data that you collect there from the Sparkle endpoint. So stay tuned for knowledge graph programming. And this chapter usually closes the knowledge graph chapter. However, we have one additional excursion for you. And this is the excursion on the graph in knowledge graphs, meaning all the time we are talking about knowledge graphs, but so far we never made use of this property that we are dealing with graphs. But to make use of the graph in the knowledge graph, we have to know more about it. So we have to learn a little bit of graph theory to find out, for example, what is an important node in a knowledge graph or to find out, yeah, how should I compare two knowledge graphs? Because I want to choose a knowledge graph for a specific purpose, which one might be better suited. So how to characterize knowledge graphs, how to compare knowledge graphs and how to determine the importance of a node or the importance of an edge. This will be subject then here of the last excursion of this lecture. Okay. So these are the topics we are dealing with now in lecture number four or in the lecture number nine, nine, part four of knowledge graphs. As always, relax, focus on the specific parts and I hope you will have fun.